Hi, my name is Ron Johnson. Today's gonna be a different video. Today's gonna be about me and why I became a life coach. Obviously, those out there that have seen me, I'm a personal trainer, I'm definitely in health and fitness and wellness, and that's my journey. But not, not many people know my personal journey. For those out there that are facing hardship, for those out there that are facing difficult times, I want to let you know that you may be facing difficult times right now, but you can get through it. And the other side is a possibility of something. Where I am today is not where I projected to be. I projected to be the engineer. I projected to work for a Fortune 500 company, making lots of money, right? Obviously, buying the fancy cars, buying a nice house. That's why I expected my journey. But it's not where I am today. I'm really happy where I am today. I'm a life coach. I help people um, that work with obstacles, that are confronting hardships right now, uh, be it leadership roles or in roles where it comes to just personal finances or in relationships. I'm here to help you. So I'm gonna talk about myself and this journey right here is gonna be more authentic than ever before. I'm gonna show personal detail with you because being in a place where I can help people and showing that there's hope on the other side of whatever you're going through is more important to me. So here's my journey starts. My journey starts at this. I was five years old and I'm a little boy playing with his action figures, his toys, you know, just being a happy guy. And unfortunately about when I was five years old, I was molested by my next door neighbor. At the time, I didn't understand what that meant. The term molested was, in the 90s, was, you know, hush, hush, you talk about it. We didn't even know what the word was. Having internet, it didn't exist. Well, how it unfolded was very simple. We went down to this cane park at my dad's house, my neighborhood where my dad lived at at that time. And I whispered to my cousin, hey, this is me and Brian Hump. Now, on the bottom of the cane was a board. And at that board, we actually performed a sexual act of being molested as I was a kid. At the time, obviously, I didn't know what it meant. All I said was to my cousin, Brian and I come down here and we hump. She was shocked. She told my sister. My sister was shocked. We ran home. I took a shower. She was crying like crazy on the phone. I will never forget her tears because, you know, my sister and I were eight years apart and she was supposed to protect her little brother. How can this be happening, right? For someone that we all knew. This was a neighbor. It wasn't like some random guy, but someone we actually knew. We talked to, we knew his first and last name, we knew his family, all that stuff. So she told my dad, and man, what I thought wasn't supposed to happen, happened. I thought if I told my cousin, I would, um, no one would get in trouble. I thought that people would know, okay, this is your hump, and this is what's happening. I didn't know it was wrong, right? I just knew something was happening. My dad was upset, goes down there, confronts the neighbor. Uh, the neighbor can't believe this, and we think we're lying, and you know, they started ensuing a fight, cops were called. From there, opens an investigation. Um, opens a case. Um, I'll never forget this experience. I really hated this experience. Is um, I went to a psychologist and she gave us two Raggedy Ann dolls. For those that in the 90s, Raggedy Ann doll is basically a doll with red hair, but you can Google it. So um, she made me sit there and describe using these dolls what happened. It was the most excruciating moment I can remember. Um, I'm only telling this now because I was so suppressed in my feelings of what happened to me, I was not able to share them, but now I can share it now. I hated going to the therapist. I hated the fact that at the same time, Brian, which I thought was my friend, was in trouble. Uh, we didn't talk. His sister actually went to my elementary school, because five years old, I went in kindergarten, first grade. They would be mean to me. They were upset. How can I get the brother in trouble? It was, so I would have to walk past his house to get to my house. So from there, you sometimes cross the street or I would never be able to walk home by myself. In the 90s, you walk home by yourself or walk with your friends, but it's very scary going to my neighborhood because I had to walk by his house. My sister was upset, so he actually went to her high school. He obviously got in trouble with himself because she was upset he attacked her uh, brother. All these emotions were happening at the same time that I didn't know were happening, but I was scared. Uh, I didn't know what to do. And my dad, being a single dad, was very loving, but I don't think he emotionally knew how to talk about it, how to support it. And come from the 50s, you know, you're a man, you don't talk about your feelings, just deal with it. I think for him, he's dealt with his feelings as they were. He didn't know how to actually express them. I didn't know how to express either. I hated my mom. Every weekend I go to my mom, she wants to oh, just talk about what happened to you. Let's talk about I hated it. Why was she talking about what happened to me? I don't want to talk about it, right? Because for me as a kid, there's something that happened to me authentically. There's something that happened to me. I know how to express it. At the same time, I didn't want anybody to get in trouble. I didn't want to talk about it. That's what happened when I was five years old. As time went along, when I was seven, my dad actually remarried. Um, all I remember is we're going to my dad's closet, he opens the closet, takes out a new tuxedo and says, son, you're wearing this. I'm like, what is this for? I'm getting married. Now obviously he has a big smile on his face, he's happy, but me, I'm not understanding what's happening. 
you know, at the time it was just myself, my sister, my dad. Um, and obviously we introduced a new family to a household. So my stepmom moved with me and my sister, and my dad, everything changes. So the way I expect my life to be, now I'm taking herself, my stepmom, and my stepbrother and sister, and now it's, now it's two people, sorry, plus three people living in a household. It was what I did not want. From day one, I never realized how much I really did not like my stepmom. I actually, I, I don't know if it was a feeling as a kid or if it's a kid that, you know, people say, always say kids can tell innocence or can tell they don't like somebody. I could tell right then and there I did not like her. All I remember when I was a kid was the verbal abuse I faced. The verbal abuse I faced was the fact that I was overweight. So when I didn't do what she wanted me to do, she would obviously call me fat. Um, in the situation here, my sister eight years older than me, so she was going to college, getting ready for college. So it was just me, my stepmom, my sister and brother, my dad's at work, I was running a business, trying to work hard for herself. She actually would have abused me verbally. Fat, good for nothing, put me down. I still I didn't mean anything. And for her, her kids were on a pedestal. She always makes sure her kids were taken care of. She always makes sure her kids were actually gonna be the ones to secure anything. It was quick to blame her kids. It was quick to blame her kids for not doing something when they did something wrong. She would defend them. Until this day, I do not like Cheerios. I don't know, and I tell you exactly why I don't like doing Cheerios, like Cheerios and why I do not have like having chores. So as a kid, I liked the, the fruity cereals, Captain Crunch, the uh, um, uh, tricks, those fruity cereals. Her kids like Cheerios. So for her, well, the, the household, my kids like Cheerios. I'm only gonna buy Cheerios. I'm not gonna buy you what you want. Now, to me as a kid, when you go through a household that's very new, you need to take care of everybody. Every needs are completely different. And my needs was, I didn't like Cheerios. I don't like it to this day. Matter of fact, at rice, I really don't like rice unless it's plain or with sugar and butter. She always made, she wouldn't force me, me to eat rice with milk. See, her kids like milk on their rice. I hated it. So she made me eat it. I do not like rice unless it's plain or sugar and butter. Just one of those things. In my relationship with my stepmom and my dad, my stepmom, my dad was of the pre pretense that I go to work, I make money, you're the woman, you stay at home, you take care of the kids. So it was easy for her to always say, Ronnie, at the time he called me Ronnie, not Ron, Ronnie did this, my dad be upset, or Ronnie did this and I got him in trouble, right? For her and my dad's relationship, I don't know exactly how the relationship was and what happened with on, but there were some issues there. And what she would do is take those frustrations out on me because I'm by myself. It was not a happy childhood growing up with my stepmom. It just was, I would consider the evil stepmom of any novel you can read. She just was that person. Even as I got older, she was the same thing. I remember sitting on the phone when I was a teenager and she would talk about, you know, how we don't we're not follow Jehovah, how we don't go to meetings and damn, her kids are doing the same damn thing. It, it was really that simple. As time went along, the relationship with my stepmom and I got even more strained. I even one time told her, I said, look, I hate you. I hate who you are. I hate you as a person. She told my dad, my dad comes to me, hates a bad word. God doesn't like hate. But as a kid, how do you express how you feel about something? You just know you feel, so you say what you feel, right? There's no way or construction to say, hi, I don't like this person. I wish they were not here or this person abuses me and I don't think she's there. The hurtful thing about this whole process is my dad did not defend me. And that will always stick with me until the day I die. That I wish he, I wish I knew why he didn't, or why he stick up for me, or support me in any manner. Now, was he a good father and supported me as a person? He did, but he did not support me in those things. I think he should support me and defend me against my stepmom. What he should have done, in my perspective, again, get you out of the house and say, "Hey, you're leaving. Get out of here." The home wasn't that good. It was good sometimes, but dealing with her alone was not good at all. Elementary school was just as worse. I was the fat kid, right? So they would call me Ronald McDonald Fat Boy. That was my nickname. So every time I come to school, you know, you get that one bully. He would see me and says, there it is, Ronald McDonald Fat Boy. You want some cheeseburgers today? And I hated that. At the time, too, I didn't realize what it was. But, you know, when a guy starts going through puberty, being overweight, or hormones being released, it starts a game, you know, um, it's called gynomastica or... Um, I saggy breast tissue for males and that's what's happening. So what they used to do is put my shirt behind me so it shows that my, my chest stick out like boobs I get made fun of. At the same time, my dad wasn't big on buying the name brand shoes like the Michael Jordan and Nike. So I was going to Marshalls, going to Walmart and buying those shoes because his idea was that you have shoes on your feet, why didn't you have a name brand and they're so expensive. So you go to school overweight um, and you go to school getting picked on from kids. What do you do? 
right? You try so desperately to fit in and be normal. I remember before as a kid being told I'm not black enough. If I tried to say the N word, oh, I don't want to say it right. And those things became more and more tough for me because when you're trying to fight to fit in, you try to fight even more to fit in because you just want to be liked, you just want to be cared about, you just want to be a person, a human being. And that wasn't happening for me because kids are mean. If you're opposite than what they consider to be norm in that school, at that age, in that scenario, you're the outsider. I was the outsider in my case. In sixth grade, I was 206 pounds. I was a big boy, right? So fast forward, let's say go to elementary school. So in elementary school, sorry, in elementary school, let's say middle school, sixth grade, middle school, same thing. Um, but for me, when middle school, I was a little bit different. I was more of an introvert. So instead of focusing on trying to fit in, I focused on being different. So I'm the one that waiting by the teacher's office to, to get in first to the bell. I was always, didn't mingle with the kids because I didn't think I fit in. Um, I was always doing these things to just be opposite and I focused focus on my schoolwork so I got straight A's, which was a benefit to me getting straight A's. And now it went from my Ronald McDonald fat boy to uh, Ronald the school boy. So I was a school boy. And you know, always, you always get that one dude who wants to pick on you because you're different or he's older. I never forget the scenario. I've got this kid's name, um, but he was in the middle school. I think I was in sixth, seventh grade, he was eighth grade. He's always a pick on me, especially in my neighborhood. So one day I told my dad, he got a big long sock, okay? He put a can in there. He says, son, it picks me getting worse ass out with this sock. I would never forget that. I had this can in my bag for like weeks until the can busted, which was soda, and got my whole bag wet, so I got rid of that. Um, what's kind of cool about eighth grade is I decided to take a leap and I joined a basketball team, which is a great thing. I started playing around, I started fitting more. Now I'm a team on a basketball team. Now I can actually fit in better, and that actually felt well as I good too. By eighth grade, it was even worse. I was 250 pounds. I was just, you know, I wasn't getting a girl. Every time I saw a girl I like, I, I want to date you and I, I want to be, you know, she, oh no, Ron's gonna be a friend, you're nice. I'm like, damn, I can't just get this girl. All the girls that wanted me, I didn't find attractive. So I didn't want those either. So I'm stuck in the middle with the girl I want and with the girl I don't want. So what do you do? You don't date at all. After ninth grade, after eighth grade, I went to ninth grade, and ninth grade is where I just hit the brick wall. I just got tired of who I was. I got tired of being an awake kid. So in freshman year of high school, obviously high school is kind of one of those things you got people that are older, you're trying to fit in, you're a freshman, it's new year. So in my freshman year, I got so desperate. My dad tells me one time, he's a son, you're big bone, and I don't tell you, you know, you're just gonna be big bone the rest of your life. I was a big kid, I was 220 pounds at that time. So I'm 250 in eighth grade, down to 220. So I lost the weight in the summertime. I started trying to work out and trying to eat better. So um, my freshman year, I did something that um, I don't regret, but I did something out of desperation. If you don't have no way out, you will be creating a figure way out. That's just human nature. I took X lax for six months. Now X lax spelled E X dash L A X, and those that don't know what it is, it's more like diuretics. Pretty much, you're pooping the whole time. I mean, every day. So I wake up in the morning. There's little chocolate squares about this big. I break up a square and eat it. And I remember running home after drop off from the bus, running to get to the bathroom because I had to go so bad. I mean, it was a different experience. So I went from 220 down to 156, which that's a lot of weight loss, right? People are like, oh, wow, Ron, you lost so much weight, look better. You know, finally I got a girlfriend. So I met a girl in, in high school. Her name was Kimberly. And she was great. Um, she was beautiful. She had the looks I want, nice small waist, big butt. That's kind of what I was into at that time. And... Um, I met her and we started dating um, and it felt really, really good. Um, but I think to myself, I didn't still fit the popularity as an image. Even though I was different, I lost the weight, it still didn't fit in for me. Fast forward to my sophomore year. My sophomore year, I got on the football team. Heck yeah, freshman football team. I'm sorry, junior varsity football team. I felt so excited about that. It was fine as it would have fit in. I lost the weight and finally I can get the girl. So the idea was if I get the girl, if I get something to pursue the girl I want, even though I was dating somebody, I still want it more. You know, you're a kid, you're gonna be greedy, you wanna date as many girls as you want. And um, her and I broke up eventually over time because she at the time was a junior when I was in ninth grade and um, I was in 10th grade and she was going to college. So we broke up eventually. And it's still then I was trying to find the girl. But I will always do things to try to bring myself happiness, I'm trying to act a certain way, I'm trying to dress a certain way, I mean, I'm trying to wear the baggy pants, tight clothes. I mean, one of the guys told me, he says, Ron, this ain't you. This doesn't look like you. And, but it doesn't matter. At that point, you're just trying to fit in and be that different person. After high school, so fast forward to say to my junior year, junior was good. 
at the same time still trying to fit in, still trying to be that person. What's good about junior year, I turned 16, 17, I can have a job. So I started working at this place called FedEx USA, and at FedEx USA, I love that company working for it, because guess what, you got 30% off every single shoe. I mean, so if I wanted some new pair of Michael Jordans, 30% off. A pair of Air Force Ones, 30% off. Those, that was just popular shoes back in those days. Clothes, 30% off. So I started dressing better, right? Because and now I can be more accepted because basically I dress. So I was considered, by the senior year, I graduated the most fashionable. So I think that was a great thing because I became the most fashionable. I got in the yearbook. It was happy. It was great. I didn't understand what was happening is that I was spending a lot of money just trying to fit in. So as senior year coming along, I turned 18. Guess what I did 18? Got two credit cards. Boom. Just like that, $6,000 in debt. Because I was buying stereo for my car, new sound system, neon lights for my car. I, I was driving around, I'm buying new shoes. I wanted to buy a new pair of shoes every day so I can dress good. Didn't work. It just wasn't worse than working. But now I know it, but then I didn't. But I was trying to do all these things and that's why I got in debt. At 20 years old, I got promoted to um, a store manager in Las Vegas. So I moved a lot from San Diego, where I'm from, to Las Vegas. And Las Vegas was probably the place I would never want to move to. Um, I quite sure a lot of people in Las Vegas. I lived down there by the Bay Strip. Just not, was not a good experience for me. It was a strictly a hustle city. So everybody hustling. If you have a job, you're stealing on the side. If you have a job, you're selling drugs on the side. If you have a job, you're selling watches. It's just always a kind of a hustle kind of game. How, how can I get over somebody, how to make a fast buck? Think about it, it's a gambling city, right? So everybody's trying to spend a dollar but win a million dollars. I lived there for about six months. During that six month period, I met somebody else and um, that became my kid's mother. So those that know out there, I do have two kids. Uh, their name is Ron and Isaiah and they're both 15 and 16. So do the math, I'm at 37. I had my kids, I was 21, 22. Looking back, uh, my kid's mother and I what should not have been together. We're not the right people to be together, but we have two loving children, which I think is what we can see out of our relationship. Both kids not knowing what the hell to do. So after I had my kids, um, I was 22 at the time, I then moved back to San Diego and I started working at a place called Foot Action. I said Foot Action, Fry's Electronics. So now I'm Foot Action, now I'm Fry's Electronics. At Fry's Electronics, was a different animal itself. Um, again, I quit my job at Foot Action in Las Vegas and moved to Fry's Electronics and I, I started working, making more money. Great, right? I, I'm, I have a really good work ethic for, for going out there, perseverance, creativity, making money, and trying to do things I know will help my future. I'm just that focused when I need to be focused. But we're talking more about the emotional side now, what's happening to me. So my kid's mother and I broke up. I met somebody else and this person I actually got married to. The reason why I married this person is the fact that I shouldn't have married her because she at the time had a boyfriend, he was abusing her, and she didn't know where to go. I came along, I was broke with my kid's mother, we had issues. I was just trying to, to find somebody, right? Because me, I always wanted to be satisfied myself in outer things. And at the time, for this person, um, my ex-wife, we got married. And the reason why I married her was that the terms I would say put it on me, but she gave me some great sex, and that's what kept me around. That's the, the bottom basic line that kept me going. Obviously, it did not work out, but I tried so hard to make it work out because for me, once I get attached to somebody emotionally, once I give my heart up to that person, it's really excruciating for me hard to let go. Even though it's a bad situation, I shouldn't be in it, it's not what I should be doing, I cannot let go, period. Unless I'm dead, I obviously have to let go then. But the whole point of me telling you these stories about myself is I want you to know I've been through a lot of different things. I need to explain this too. After I got married, I was so far in debt with, when I was in Vegas, I got a hold of payday loans, loans up the wazoo, just trying to get money to survive. I had to file bankruptcy. Now, obviously, when you file bankruptcy, it's ruin your credit. I've been through that as well too. When I started working for Electronics, I became sales. I made good money. I had to pay off some debt before I filed for bankruptcy. At the Fries Electronics, I moved to San Jose. I'm in San Jose now. They promoted me to a position called the buyer. That was an okay company to work with, but again, I was only there to make more money. And obviously that's the pursuit of the efforts I made to make more money. I worked for a company that did not care about their people. What they cared about was just what kind of company they worked for. Make sure you get the job done, that was it. Let's fast forward again to now I'm 27, 28. Do my whole course between 22, 21, having kids, 28, 29, 
I myself was broken, but I just didn't know it. I was using outside things to make me happy. The more cars I had, or the more money I had, or the more girls I had, the more I felt self-worth for myself, my own personal love. And that love for me was so hard to even give. So when I would meet somebody and I would want to give my heart up, I become fearful of giving my heart because I'm fearful of getting hurt. Because when I went through with my ex-wife, leaving me for somebody else, that hurt me and broke me for years. So any relationship from 22 to now were just completely broken because I was broken and I didn't understand I was broken at that time. I was always looking for support when I was a kid, support as an adult, but really support came from myself. As I got through this process of going through ups and downs of every single relationship, not understanding what to happen, not, sorry, not understanding what should I do in a right and correct relationship, all I knew how it was just to do. And all I thought is that they gave me great sex, that they gave me this kind of love, they loved me. That's all I cared about. I didn't care about anything else. They looked good, I, they loved me. It also got so far as that, you know, sometimes you meet a relationship where the woman is more attractive. So in my case, I meet a woman that's more attractive to me, or what I deem is more attractive to me. I would spend as much money as I can. I even had this one girl I dated one time where I went out and spent $900 on Louis Vuitton shoes just to prove I loved her. I sent her 100 roses just to prove that I loved her. And it was, was for nothing. Because at the end of the day, she didn't love me. She looked like I gave her. And my emotions were always up and down. So if she had a good day, I had a good day. If she had a bad day, I didn't have a bad day. So as my support and my outer happiness was always on somebody else's shoulder, not my own shoulders, I would use outside things to make me happy. As I got into my 30s, same thing. Still broke relationships, still unhappy, still unfulfilled. Until one day, my life changed forever. Now obviously those out there know that I did quit my full-time job at Friday's Electronics to become a, a personal trainer, and now I'm a life coach. But after I quit my full-time job, it got even worse. I still was seeking outer happiness and comparison. I had a trainer of mine that I trained with for a lot of years and I would compare myself to him. To me, he was a god. To me, he's everything I wanted. He had a great body, he had a beautiful wife, he had a kid, he had money, he had everything I wanted and I wanted to be him. So bad. So when our relationship failed, after I became a trainer, I was very devastated. It's like, how can this happen? I thought we were good because I, again, here came this fear of giving to other people. Feel for giving my heart. So if you're in a relationship with me or you're a friend, my fear was giving up something. So if I gave my heart, that means I really care about you. I really care about you as a human being. But I'm fearful of doing it because I'm fearful of getting hurt. There's a flip side to that too. When you're afraid to give up your heart, you're also afraid to love. And when you're afraid to love, how can you expect the love to come and find you? Because you're afraid to give up. See, love isn't a one-way streak. It's an interchange of different things happening. So that's what happened. Our relationship fell down. It went sideways. I was very devastated. Even at the time the girlfriend I was seeing, I, I couldn't express what was going on. And our relationship, because I had made mistakes, was so bad, it just didn't work out at all. So I got lucky about two years ago. Two years ago, I broke down crying. It was August 2018. I was at my wit's end. It was had to be 11, 8, 11 p.m. at night time, and I just broke down on front of my phone. I was texting my mom. I was crying. I was so heartbroken the fact that I was tired of my life I was living. I was tired of being the person I was. I was tired knowing that I couldn't do anything else. I thought the whole time, I'm blaming it on God, and I'm looking up to the earth, on God, the reason why I have this problem. He gave me a bad deck of cards, or he gave me a bad situation. It's his fault, not mine. From then on, I said to myself, I'm going to do something about it. I just met the next day with the Google and went to motivation. And the first person that popped up was John Maxwell. And the audible I downloaded, because I started listening to audible at the time, was 15 invaluable laws to growth. From then on, my life got better. I started listening to more audibles, learning that the healing comes within, knowing that I need to heal myself before I can move forward, learning that I can be better than what I am now, possibilities are out there. I'm not held a bad deck of cards. So it's like I'm shifting my power, my energy from where I was to now looking back says, well, I can do this. I don't have a preordained destiny from when I was a kid being molested to now to be just nothing. So for myself, after the audibles, I started I hired a life coach. It was the best experience I ever had. I got past any fears, any self-doubt, 
not saying fears will go away, but passing the self-doubt of not being that person and actually start being a much better person overall. From then on, I became a life coach. And that's why I'm today shooting this video because I want you to let you know hope is out there and you can be better than what you really are right now. You can change. It starts with you. I was a molested kid. I was a kid with a bad stepmom. I had low self-esteem. I had low confidence. I had no self-worth. I cheated so many times on women in relationships because I myself didn't know how to heal myself. So if you're out there facing obstacles, you're stuck where you are, I can help because I've been there. I've been broke. I filed bankruptcy. I had bad credit. I had poor leaders. The experience is there and I can help you doing that because I made it and so can you. Thanks for listening again to Ron Johnson, The About Me Story.